So the problems of the world are complex. We are faced with climate change, with financial and economic and steady crisis, with conflicts and war pieces quite unstable these days. And of course, one of the threats to humanity is also diseases. And this is what we're talking about today. So altogether we can say our world is unfortunately in very bad shape, but we see signs of instability everywhere, and that creates existential threats. And as a result, we have to do something. And for that very reason, a couple of years ago, back in 2010, we established this future ICT community, which was bringing together natural scientists and engineers and social scientists in more than 25 countries in order to address those grand challenges in the world. And uh, we developed this future ICT project and had a, a couple of goals, and uh, one of them was to build a third of the system, and another one was to build a linear simulator, and the third one a global participatory platform. So the idea was to generate real-time data and uh, use that to feed a large-scale computer simulation of the world. We use that again to do mechanism design, to come up with better solutions for the world and create a participatory platform so everyone can benefit from this. Now, this is a competition in the European Union for 1 billion euros. In the end, we didn't get the money, but given that we lack 1 billion euros, uh, I think we made quite big uh, progress. And for example, at the time when we started, data science was not around in Europe. Computational <coughs> science was boosted by future ICT. Global system science was brought on the way. And so a lot of the ideas that we had have actually made quite significant progress. And I can give you only a few insights over here. So co to come back to the planetary nervous system, in fact, we are now working on this. The yeah, idea is that if you just had the right kind of data about the world, you could see what is wrong. And if we can see this, we could fix the system where it is broken, right? <laughs> and people think that the data is a way basically to get these kind of insights. And in fact, the data is being used for all sorts of things, in particular also for new prediction. For example, as we Google through trends, as we look into frequencies of search and search queries of users, and in this way we have, uh, after correlating basically these queries with uh, clue signals, they, uh, we're trying to predict the clue, and it worked perfectly well for some time. It was uh, considered to be one of the big uh, success stories, and then Alice Vignani came in. So that actually it's not so good. And we scientists can in fact do better than that. So if you're looking to data, for example, of the World Health Organization, where diseases occur, who gets them, in what place, in what time, then you know, things are pretty messy. And you can see these broadly scattered data. It's a mess, as I said, right? So when you look at uh, health data, where people fall ill, what time, what place, and how it changes over time, then it's a big mess. And that's why you have this widely scattered data over here. So it basically says nothing. It's very frustrating, and there's a reason for this. Uh, the reason is that diseases don't just diffuse in space. Maybe a couple of hundred years back, it was like this. Instead, what happens is you know, people actually take a plane. And uh, unfortunately, they're also transmitting diseases in this way. So this messes up this beautiful diffusion process. And uh, that's why we have this many data. However, if we combine the health data with travel data, then it's possible to define an effective distance. So for example, Frankfurt 
and uh, your city or ambassador down in Tokyo would be nearby. Within that effective distance, then, you can see a beautiful circular spreading pattern again. And this allows you to identify the origin of the disease and also to predict what would be the next cities to be hit by a flu wave. So basically, you know, things transform from the spreading dynamics on the right into the spreading dynamics on the left, which can be understood by mathematical formulas. So that's something we published here at Parkman and I in science. Now, of course, there are also interesting spreading phenomena in all sorts of other systems. So, for example, spreading of scientific innovation is something that scientists care about. Spreading of scientific concepts called memes, spreading of cultures over thousand years, spreading of conflict, unfortunately, too. So all of that can be looked at through the lens of big data. But, as I said, the important point is to understand what's behind the dynamics. Only then we can really change things to the better. And so in science, we have always had the concept of a measurement process, in physics in particular. And so we want to apply that basically to society and to the economy. And for this purpose, we started to work on a section of a system called NewsNet, which is a participatory citizen web that cares about privacy, but still views <coughs> the opportunities of the Internet of Things if you want to participate in that project. In fact, each of us can use the smartphone <laughs> in our pockets, and there are about 15 sensors in those smartphones. We could use those sensors to measure things about our environment. We could build actually a global measurement system, and in this way, for example, measure noise or pollution or light or uh, measure where the resources are located and who's using them and all this. And we're working on apps to do this, for example, small house. Now, next thing was computer simulation. In fact, there has been large progress too in many areas, from traffic over pedestrians and crowds to opinion information, uh, the formation of the level conventions, cooperation and many tales, spreading of crime, the evolution of moral behavior, <coughs> or of social preferences, or of social norms, all of that can be actually understood in a mathematical way, can be simulated in a computer, can be used to compare different scenarios that could help, for example, reduce the level of conflict that we're seeing in Jerusalem or the Middle East or other places around the world. And that's something that a lot of people actually care about. And all of these developments and developments in the entire community have added up to computational social science and uh, also to global system science. And of course, uh, network science is a major part of this. And in networks in particular, we often see cascading effects. And this makes things difficult to understand in many cases and may also make the system get out of control. So here is an example illustrating that a local perturbation could actually eventually mess up an entire system. And actually, that mess could happen on a global scale, unfortunately. And while this is still a fun experiment for a rainy weekend, now this one hopefully is no experiment. It shows the cascading effect after the failure of Lehman Brothers. You see hundreds of banks go bust, and it costs the taxpayer hundreds of billions of dollars. Um, the world economy is still pretty shaky and in a very bad shape, and we need to be concerned about these kind of things. Now, one of the reasons, actually, for the spreading is that networks have become, in a sense, too dense. Um, there is too much connectivity, and this kind of thing matters also for the spreading of diseases, right? So there are certain kind of specials that determine. Uh, how 
fast disease is spread and how fast recovery happens here at all. And as you can see, what happens uh, is that uh, degrees of networks matter over here, the mean values uh, of k, also um, averages of k squared. And you can imagine that in certain kinds of networks, in particular scale free networks, those quantities are not even defined. And uh, that creates a situation where things really could get totally uncontrollable. And these kind of things also happen in society. When talking about populism, it seems pretty much that you know, the dynamics of opinions is becoming pretty uncontrollable. And here is a simulation that illustrates that if you add just a few additional links, in this case, long-term connections, then for some time nothing bad happens. You can contain the disease, but then eventually you will cross the threshold and things will turn very bad. Um, display that very quickly. Um, red means somebody who fell ill. Green means healthy. You see you know, just a few ill people, most people stay healthy. And you know, things are looking good for as long as we don't add these additional links. In this case, we're adding 100 shortcuts. You know, imagine that would be flight connections between different places of the world. And for some time, things still look good, but eventually, you know, uh, we'll see that things still turn into a very different state. Oh my god. <laughs> So, uh, of course, we cannot let this happen, and uh, when there are cascading effects, people think about ways to stop the cascades. In this case, uh, it's about vaccination. There is a mathematics that allows us to understand what is kind of the pandemic threshold, where things get out of hand, and that threshold can be changed by people immunizing themselves, and we can calculate how many people that should be. Now, it turns out actually that uh, paying attention to the average percentage of people in the country that have the flu or some other disease that we care about um, is not a good piece of information for your own decision whether you should humanize yourself or not. It's much more relevant what happens around you before you get infected uh, by your neighbors, and uh, that is why it's important to have more local information. In fact, there's an informational sweet spot where uh, the neighborhood basically becomes most relevant for your decision making. So this brings us actually to participatory systems, and in fact, in IT, uh, age of the digital revolution, digital systems will become more and more important. They will help us not only to find the route to our destination, but also to handle disasters such as earthquakes and other crises and help each other and uh, keep up the economy when the, the old economy has failed. And they would be compasses for decision makers and help us in all sorts of situations to perform well, to interact successfully with others. And all of that is important also, of course, in the health area where we now have a quantified health movement. People are actually recording data about their health and their activities and all this. And this is important to get that local level information that I have just been talking about. In fact, there's a project called Influenza Net that Alex Espiani has also brought on the way, which is now also available in Switzerland, and where we call it Equipment. And here we can see actually that uh, we are now getting this kind of uh, local information that we are looking for. And this is very promising altogether because citizens will want to empower themselves and collect data and look into data and citizen science becomes more and more important and that has a 
a number of reasons. First of all, that creates more research capacity, more speed, more impact, and more reliance on speed, quality, and mission local knowledge, and so on. So, really, the future is in systems that bring great ideas and the knowledge of many people together. So, I'm talking about the wisdom of crowds, which can really be astonishingly successful if we pay attention to a number of preconditions for this principle to work. First of all, diversity matters. Second of all, people should collect information independently, make their mind back independently. This is something which is undermined now by social media, the media altogether, by social bots and so on. So this is undermined in the wisdom of crowds that we would really need to have more. And decentralization application. So there are good reasons why we should build digital democracy platforms that empower citizens to come up with better solutions. And I'm closing on this slide which says that we actually need more wisdom uh, to address the challenges of this world than more power. Thank you much. situation in terms of lots of privacy because basically every click that we do is being recorded and it goes through AI systems that learn about every one of us and not only know us very well and all our weaknesses but also they are manipulating us. You know? I think that's a very bad situation where citizens, companies, governments have lost control uh, in many respects, we'll give a talk about this tomorrow. And it's really about reclaiming autonomy. And what we need is basically a platform that allows people uh, to exercise this informational self determination, right? So, whenever data would be collected or produced about you, it should be sent into something like a data mailbox and then you could decide who is allowed to do what with this data for what time period. Of course, you wouldn't want to administer your data for three hours every night. So we should build AI system that would know what you care about and, and these AI systems would do it for you according to your personal preferences and so on. You know, I think this is the way to go. These platforms can be built and we should build a uh, digital society based on trust, you know, so we would give more data to those companies and institutions that we trust more, and then we will eventually have the kind of society we would really want to live in. Still make the decision that's good for everybody. 
Yeah, that's government. That's what the government will do. I, I think uh, what has been tried in the past decades is to create these one-size-fits-all solutions. You know, so basically you come up with a spectrum of possible solutions, and you pick one that you consider to be the best, and then you impose it on every citizen of the world. You know, that was the vision. You know, uh, basically driven by a wrong idea of optimization of the world. I do think what the rather need is a resilient world that can cope with unexpected developments and resilience requires diversity, it requires a certain degree of decentralization and um, it means we should allow different solutions to happen, we need to experiment more with solutions that look promising and then communicate with each other, exchange our experiences and learn so we would have a combination of intelligent design and evolution, right? And uh, I think what you're now seeing is that uh, the, the classical paradigm of globalization is busted, it's uh, yeah, not working any longer, Brexit, US election, show this. Um, I will come back uh, to another paradigm uh, which will allow for more diversity. Uh, I think we'll end up with what I call globalization. I mean, think global, act local. You know, allow people to come up with local solutions that fit local needs and culture. And I think then we'll be getting on a better way. And. I believe altogether we need to do a few more things. I think what's really limiting the evolution of our societies around the world is the financial system that we have. I think we deserve a much better system. I have some ideas how to build it. it Can now be built with the technology which is around. And we have to do that pretty soon, so we would get towards a circular economy, a sustainable economy, an economy that really unleashes all the innovation capacity that is present in society. And we would have to build society in such a way really to, to maximize this innovation capacity, but at the same time take into account external effects, so-called externalities. Um, so we would automatically care about social and environmental issues and climate uh, change too, right? So put together Internet of Things, blockchain technology and complexity science and you get the system that we need. Thank you very much. And then, uh, yeah,